Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. It's so good to hear you guys singing so loud. I can hear you. It sounded so good. And I just want to say, this is the first night I brought notes. Which is the milestone, you're like, wouldn't you needed them before? No, I actually just needed to speak from my heart before because I was having a hard time focusing. And I'm still having a hard time focusing sometimes. So it might just slip into, I'm just gonna go with my heart, what the Spirit is saying, but I'm believing that the Lord has given me some things and I wrote them, put them on paper and I'm gonna try to focus and do that. But I think I just wanna recognize every milestone matters. Whatever you're healing from, Whatever you're moving on from, every milestone matters. Also, it's the first time I've worn heels, I'm just saying. Every milestone matters. Remember, I was not wearing shoes there for a while. Remember? And I said I was going to take my shoes off and leave them off until I was healed, and I was. So, I put my shoes back on, and I'm preaching in shoes, and today is the first time I've worn heels. And so, but I'm going to sit down, so it doesn't really matter. But we are claiming healing in the layers. We're declaring it in every layer. And we're thankful. And yes, I still thank God for Crest Toothpaste with all the extras. And I hope that you did too. I hope that you looked your toothpaste a little different this week. I really do. I really hope that you looked at the simple things a little differently this week. The small things that you recognize are part of this amazing life that you get. This saved life, this second chance life, this redeemed life, this healed life, this delivered life that you're living. Please don't miss the tiny little reminders that you're doing it and that God did it for you. And he's not done. He's not done. So what we declare, Eric talks about, but I just want to say what we declare takes root in us. And what God has declared over us, he hopes that we'll receive it. And if you will look up the word declare in certain translations of the Bible, certain versions of the Bible, you will see that certain versions use the word declare and some don't. But it's the same meaning. So if you will, sometime, just do a search and see how many times you see the word declare. Especially in the NIV, you'll see the word declare. And you'll see it many different times that this is a declaration that's being made. And if we would receive his word, if we receive the declaration that the Lord speaks over us and the things that he's called us to declare, it will take root in us. Yes. It will. The things that we declare take root in us. Yes. But tonight, we are going to talk about declare and focus. What we declare takes root, but what we focus on expands. stories I can tell about that. You have cancer. Not anymore. I believe. But you know, there's a thousand stories you could tell about that. That what we focus on expands. Many people are asking me, what are you going to do with this miracle, Marcia? Well, I'm going to tell the whole world.
All right, forget my story. What are you going to do with your story? Amen. Well, Marcia, I don't have, I didn't have cancer. I don't have that story. Right? But God has helped you break that generational pattern. God has delivered you of that substance addiction. God has helped you overcome that traumatic event in your life. God has helped you rise up to new levels. You were lost and now you're found. The only story here isn't cancer. I'm looking at a room full of stories. What are you going to do with your story? And it's so easy to be like, oh, Marsha, your story. And it is a, it's a good one. I agree. I mean, I'm still wrapping my mind around it. It was so fast. Not really. But what we got to be part of, I'm still wrapping my mind around it. And it's not over, y'all. But I'm not the only one in this room with a great big story. What are you doing with it? My friend, you've got a story you've got to tell the world about a God who saves. Yes. There are people that wonder if it's still true. Yeah. That there's room at the table for them. They have to know that there is room for everyone. They have to know that there is God that is still doing miracles, absolutely. But sometimes that miracle is that he provides the right amount of money at the right time. Sometimes the miracle is that yes to that question you've been asking for a long time. Sometimes that miracle is that breakthrough you've been waiting on for a long time. You've got to tell the world about a God who saves and frees and redeems yes. and sustains. You've got to tell the world about a God who heals and restores you have a story, too. What are you going to do with it? We know I'm going to be telling some stories up here on Saturday night, okay? You know that. But this is the only place I'm telling the story. you got to tell the story about a God who creates. A God who creatively met exactly the need you had in the exact amount of time. That it was needed. Yes, 11 59. 59 can be excruciating, but he comes through. Yeah. What we declare takes root, and what we focus on expands. I did a whole page. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm not going to miss a moment. Are you missing moments? You think people make fun of you if you celebrate the little things? Get over it! Celebrate the little things! You're pointing to a mighty big God. Celebrate the tiniest little things. Your deliverance is worth it. I'm going to take you down through a series of scriptures here. Because I know I'm talking to a room full. Some of you have been believers for a long time. And some of you are still trying to figure it out. But I'm going to stick with my notes. And I pray that those of you that have been in the Word for a long time will glean something new tonight. And I hope for those of you that are still trying to figure it out that something will speak to you. But you've got to tell your story, friends. And if you're not telling your story because you're still trying to figure it out, listen to this. When temptation rises, declare and focus. Declare Jesus and focus on your new life in Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians says, if you are a new creation in Christ, the old is gone, the new is here. When you find yourself smack dab right back in the middle of that same temptation that sees you for years and you start to wonder, did I really have that experience with Jesus? Did I really? Yes, you did. Claim the old is gone and the new is here. 
You're gonna be tempted. You're gonna be tempted. It's a crossroads we've all taken and we're all taking. But choose to remember what happened with Jesus was real. Declare Jesus and focus on the new life that he has given you and that you want in him. Because the old is gone and the new has come. Declare it and focus on that. And that will expand. When you focus on that temptation, what's going to happen? Did I hear an amen? Because I've, I've done that. I focus on that temptation and that's the only thing I can think of. That's the only thing I can see. Amen, Olivia. Declare Jesus and focus on the new life that he has offered you. And that will expand, my friend. Amen. When your healing seems distant, declare Jesus and focus on this. By his stripes, you are healed. Amen. That does not always mean a physical healing, friends. But when you focus on him, and what he did at the cross, the next thing you know, that expands. And your ailment, whatever it is, emotional, mental, or physical, seems to grow distant. By his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53, 5. When your healing seems distant, declare Jesus and focus on that. When fear wraps its arms around you and you can barely move, and I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna be talking about fear in just a few minutes. When fear wraps its arms around you and you can barely move, ever been paralyzed with fear? I have. Declare Jesus and focus on his peace because it is yours. John 14, 27 says, and he said it, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Do you understand what's happening here? When you're afraid, declare Jesus and focus on his peace. Because what you declare takes root and what you focus on expands. And if you can declare Jesus and focus on his peace, what is happening now? Fear and peace. His peace is ours. Receive it. Grab for it. I mean, grab for it. I don't know about you, but sometimes you guys are a little too poised. I'm sorry, my feet are starting to sweat. <laughs> so you know what that means. I haven't worn these shoes in a long time. Some of you guys are, little, are very poised, and I just want to show you what it looks like to really, really, really be peace. Above all names, so that person with that name that 
didn't receive you. Oh, he's higher. That important, seemingly significant person that didn't want you to be part. Oh, he's more important. Significance. He hits it. Bullseye. Every time I'm a child of him, that's who wants me. When I declare Jesus and I focus on him, I was still rejected. But that chosenness that he is speaking over me, that I am his, and he wants me, expands. That's going to be 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Listen, say it, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know him, know us, is that it did not know him. And so they think there's somebody and they reject you, but they don't know him. And you do. And he wants you, and he wants them too. Declare Jesus and focus on the fact that you are a child Chosen, received, child of God. When you are mocked for your faith, declare Jesus and focus on the fact that the world did the same thing to him. John 15, 18. He says it this way. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. He goes off after this. The whole chapter, John 15, it's amazing because it's like joy and love and fruit. And he's like, and by the way, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. Then he goes off. Read John 15. But let me tell you something. I've been mocked for your faith. You're in great company. Jesus says, the world doesn't want any part of you because they didn't want any part of me. Yes, they're going to hate you. You should almost expect it. That doesn't mean we don't love them and that we don't reach. That's the whole point. We got to keep doing that. But it will ha- you will be mocked for your faith at some point in your life as a Christian. It will happen. If you are living out the Christian faith, it will happen. But you've got to remember whose you are and what company you keep. You are in good company, my friend. You keep your head up, you keep your eyes on Jesus and let the focus of his chosenness in you expand and then he will fill you with the ability to respond well. It's hard. But you're in good company. Whatever curveballs are coming at you, there's, there's so many of them. But we have got to declare Jesus. And focus on him. I'm going to talk about fear for a second. Tell a little story. Leave my notes for a minute. Of course I dealt with fear. Going through cancer. And and the news that I got was really ridiculous. And the first diagnosis was terrible. and, And my news kept getting like worse there for a little while. And then it would get better, but then it would get worse. And there's some scans that I had, some things I had that we didn't really update everyone on every time because sometimes it was just like, I don't even know how to say this. I don't even know how to say this. So it didn't go out to people, didn't go out to the church. Some things didn't go out to our family until we had to because we needed prayer. And we knew that if it developed any further that everyone would find out. We're thankful that things backed up. Better than expected, amen? But through the seasons that we felt, more so seasons of emotions than seasons of time, through the days where we felt like courage was really at our back and in front of us, and, and then there were days that it felt dark and hard and we just had to fight for every ounce of courage in us, especially me. And those days, I would say, were the days that I had to fight fear. I'm going to tell you something. Remember that poise I said you guys have? I don't have it. And it was a fist fight. 
Because I'm not sitting back. Listen, devil. You tried to take me out once before, and I'm not going to go out without fighting. And I wanted you to hear me. I don't care what he brings at you. Don't you go out. If you need me to come over and stand in, I will. Okay? I'll take some boxing matches out. You guys know I have boxing gloves, right? It's real. But no fight like fear. And probably none harder than the thoughts of death. And maybe, like, what about my boys? What about my children? You know, Dallas hasn't finished his college yet, and Daniel just got married, and what about them? What about Eric, and he's not their biological father, and if I go, I'm the glue. What happens to them? What happens to the whole family dynamic? It's a lot, y'all. And so there were a lot of hard days and moments, and a lot of times it wasn't, you know, a whole day, but a moment. I had to just really come up against it. And I know some of you understand. You've been here. Some particular times when I've been really bad doctor's appointments, and then you have to try to pretend like you're okay, but you're just not. And one day in particular, I had shoved off so many fearful thoughts, so many times, so many times, so many times, and I just, I did the work. And one day I thought, listen here, you want to ask me that question one more time? What would happen if I die? All right, then let's talk about it. What would happen? So I'm going to ask the question back to myself and I'm going to hold this in my hand. Let's say I die. What do I want to do before I die? What do I want to say before I die? Because if this question keeps coming back up to me, I don't want to give it any more power. And so I'm going to answer the question. There are a lot of times, and I'll come back to the story in a second, but there are a lot of times that these, quite, these fearful thoughts come up. And we just push them away, we push them away, push them away, because we know it's wrong, it's, we know where it's coming from. But church, I want to give you permission to go ahead and ask the question back. And take some of that power away from the darkness and answer the question. Because that question is there to do one of two things. Is there to paralyze you? Or is there to prepare you? And so I'm like, listen, I want to be prepared because it's possible. And by the way, it's possible for every single one of us. And so I decided, what do I want to say to my kids? What do I want to say to my boys? If I end up in a hospital bed and they have just enough time to get there for me to say one last thing, what do I want to say? Let's go. What do I want to say? So I thought about it. When I have to kiss my husband goodbye, what do I want to say? And I'm not going to throw this away. I'm going to visit that. And those are really the three. I love you guys, but those are the three. I'll preach a good sermon. I'll urge you guys to live it out. But what I want to say to these three people. And so I planned it. I prepared it. I didn't let it paralyze me. And once I had that conversation with God and myself, anytime that fear came back up, I was like, oh, we've already got a plan. Don't worry. You can't have that place in me. I've already got a plan, devil. So shut up. And so the news started getting better at one point. But I was going to have a major surgery. And I was sitting in pre-op. With a peace that passes understanding. Because what you declare take roots and what you focus on expands. And as I focused on Jesus in pre-op for this major cancer surgery. Tons of nurses had come in and prepped me and got me ready and IVs and everything, and you're wearing these socks and you're, you know, everything, you're ready. 
but there's about 30 minutes between the last nurse that prepped me and then it's time to go. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm really at peace. Amazingly at peace. Thankfully at peace. And so I started, um, I took some pictures of my hospital socks. And I sent those to my family. And, and then I wrote it. I wrote what I would say. Anything can happen in surgery. And so I wrote it. And I sent it to them. No one would know how much they meant to me. And how big God is for bringing them into my life. And how big God is. And, and I sent it in the most overwhelming sense of I was prepared for that. The enemy did not steal my peace pre-surgery. I knew what I was going to say. And I sent that and I smiled. I wasn't sad. I was at peace. And they came in and they got me and they said, ready to go? I said, more ready than ever, you know. And of course now we're friends because that's how I roll. And so I'm calling by name, you know. And so we're talking, and then they get me out of my room, and I'm going around the nurse's desk, and they're like, you're going to be well taken care of. I said, thanks, guys. And we're headed towards the elevator, and there's no more people to talk to, and it's just me and this nurse, and the lights above me, and this is what came rushing over me. For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. For all that you've promised and know that all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. And I thank you. Thank you, Lord. And I thank you. Thank you, Lord. And I say all the way to the operating room. In my heart and in my head. And when I got to the operating room, I wanted to make sure that I saw every single person that was going to be working on me and every single instrument that was going to be touching me. And so as I finished up my song, Thank you for loving and setting me free. And the song ends, How I thank you, Lord. And I was kind of finishing as we were coming down the hall, sit, the hallway, so I prepared myself to kind of sit up. And when we got to the operating room, I looked around. And I saw the robot that was going to be invading my body. And I saw the window that my surgeons were going to be watching through. And I saw the nurses and the anesthesiologist again. And I saw the instruments, and I saw the bed they were going to be moving to, and I could barely see their eyes from their caps and their masks. And I just felt so thankful. I felt so prepared in his spirit. And I'm not saying it's a perfect formula, but when peace comes, don't be afraid to answer. When fear comes, don't be afraid to answer the question, what if? Don't be afraid to answer the question. What if I die? What do I want my family to know? What if I have cancer? What am I prepared to do? What if I don't? How am I going to celebrate? But church, take inventory of what's there to paralyze you and what's there to prepare you. We carry a lot of fear. We give it a lot of power. Maybe it's just time to answer some of those questions. And as I looked around the room, I just felt so thankful and I began to cry for the first time. 
And one of my nurses said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I just feel really thankful for how you guys are about to help me. And she said, well, we're gonna take good care of you. Now scoot on over here to the bed and relax. And I did. And when I woke up, once I was in my room, I was told, told that everything went better than expected. And it might not have gone that way, but I'm so glad that I thought through what I wanted to say, and I wrote it down, and I sent it. I'm thankful that the devil wasn't able to paralyze me, but that the Lord prepared me. They'll have those words forever, and I have it right here forever. Don't let fear paralyze you. We will all feel it, and it will come ringing back again, and ringing back again, and ringing back again. But don't be afraid of fear. Sometimes it's there to prepare you. I pray this, James 1.5, that you will have the wisdom to know that when those fears come, whatever your storm, I pray that when those fears come to you, that you will have the wisdom to know that it is there to either paralyze you or prepare you. And it is clear, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. He's generous to give it. Are we thankful for that? And if you say, Lord, this fear is daunting. It is haunting me. And I am feeling like hands tied. What is this? Is this here to paralyze me? Because if so, I'm trashing the sucker. But if it is here to prepare me, then help me answer the question. What if? Oh, church, I pray that when fear comes, because I know it will, that you will have the wisdom to know if those fears have come to paralyze you or to prepare you. Some of you are smack dab in the center of some really, really, really difficult circumstances. And I want to repeat myself. What you declare takes root. What you focus on expands. Some of your circumstances are pretty major. Your marriage, your job, your finances, your future, hanging the balance of your circumstance. And I want you to hear me tonight. We're going to look at Galatians 5, 13 through 26. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Your circumstance may not change, but when you fix your eyes on Jesus, your circumstance will have a clearer view of how to respond. In Galatians 5, 13 through 26, do you have that? You do not have that. That is okay. It goes on to talk about the fruit of the Spirit and how we are to be in step with the Spirit. And when we stay in step with the Spirit, that we can resist the things of our flesh and list many of them. And then it goes to talk about that, but if we will stay in step with the Spirit, that it will grow up this fruit inside of us. And you know those. Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That when we stay in step with the Spirit, even in the midst of our circumstances, when we declare Jesus and we focus on Him and we focus on this Galatians 5, 13, 26 lifestyle, which write that down so you can have it this week, Galatians 5, 13 through 26, and we focus on Jesus and, and His way and His will for our lives and how to navigate our circumstances focuses in and expands, then we know exactly what to do, what next step to take, and the fruit of him rises up in us. Amen. We become more like him and we respond more like him. And I know your, some of your circumstances are so hard and you do not even know what pinky toe to move next. Declare Jesus and focus on taking your next step led by the Spirit. Not only will He lead you well and you will have no regrets with it, 
you'll become more like him, growing in the fruits of the Spirit. I pray that your circumstances would change. Some of you, I pray daily that your circumstances would change. And I can't change it for you. And sometimes we can't change it for ourselves. But one of the things I do is I always speak the name of Jesus over you and your home and your health. And that you will focus on him and that Jesus will be giant in front of you. And not your circumstance. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And I'm aware that healing isn't just health. We have some people in our church that are healing from childhood traumas, from recent terrible situations. We have layers and levels of healing that we can't even speak of. And I'm aware that healing has many different lanes. But I pray for your healing. You know, one of the things about being healed is that you believe in healing. We're told also in, in James, we would have to go back to that scripture because I don't have this included, but in that James chapter, in that James passage, if you'll write this down, after that it goes to say, pray and pray with faith. Don't have any doubt. Well, one thing about being healed is you pretty much go into prayer for healing with faith. And so I want you to hear me. You need a healing in your life? I'll pray for it. Because you listen to me. I know a healer. I know him. And so do you. So do you. You saw it. You journeyed it with me. You know a healer too. Don't forget what you saw. Don't forget what you lived. Don't forget what we went through. You know a healer too, and it doesn't just have to be help to call a Jehovah Rapha and call for zeros and say no mas over your life. The healing that you need might be deeper than a physical, it might be mental or emotional, but I know a healer. And by his stripes, you are healed. I had a friend once tell Eric and I in the midst of a conflict we were in with someone else that if you go in there and you fight for yourselves, you're going to get a courtroom. And this is what, I won't go all the way to the cross because I don't know if we're going to be online and my online friends really matter to me. But she said, if you'll go to the foot of the cross and look up and remember what he fought for, then you'll come out of there victorious. The healing that we need begins at the foot of the cross, my friends. Because if we go there and we look up, all of a sudden, this worldly trouble just kind of changes. The lens changes. Doesn't mean that there's not healing to take place, but the route that we take to get there looks much different when we go there first. But see, if I focus on my pain, Just do it like that. If I can focus on that and square up with who Jesus is and what he has done and what he is saying about my pain. Then all of a sudden, by his stripes, I am healed. He will help me navigate the hard and he will help me stand fully in the holy. And I'm thinking about the paralytic who was by the pool of Bethesda. And 
Jesus came through and healed him. And it was a Sunday, a Sabbath. Some of you know the story well. Got some pastors in there. And the paralytic was healed. Jesus healed the paralytic. He had mercy on him. And he healed him. And of course, he was crying out that he needed healing and that every time those water stir, everybody runs and jumps in for themselves and I can't move. And so Jesus heals him and, and he ends up saying, take up your mat and walk. And he did it. And then he goes through the crowd walking. And the lawmakers were like, how did, you, how did this happen? And he's like, someone touched me and now I'm, 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 I'm healed. And, and now I can walk. And, and they got caught up on the rule is you don't work on the Sabbath. And they got caught up on the law. And then, you know, all that kind of breaks down. But here's what I'm going to say about that. When we focus on our pain, it gets really close. It expands. When we focus on our healing, when we receive the healing, whether it's in the heart or the mind or the body, please take up your mat and walk. Please. Don't get worried about what people are going to say, what they're going to get caught up on. Well, but are you really or are you just having a good day? Or that's not true. People get caught up on the strangest things. This man was paralyzed and now he's walking and they're caught up on the law. People in your life are going to get caught up on some weird stuff, y'all. But you take up your mat and you walk and you claim, I am healed. Whatever the healing is, mental, emotional, or physical, because by his stripes, you are healed. Eric and I know many of your stories and know much of your stuff, and we're praying for you. We wish we could change it. We wish we could fix it, but we can't. And so we pray for your healing. We pray for fear to flee. We pray for circumstances to change. We pray for the breakthroughs in your life. Because let me tell you something. We want to see you freed and delivered and well and healing. But you want to know something else? We've got work to do, church. I can't wait for some of you to tell the story of your breakthrough. And some of you have gotten one. And it's time to tell the story. We want to see you healed. We want to see you whole. We want to see your circumstances change. We want to see you overcoming. Absolutely. We want to see you victorious. But I also know, and then we got work to do. Amen. There's a world that needs to know that he is still doing miracles. That victory is still possible. That healing, Jehovah Rapha, is a real role that he plays. Not just a cool name. The world needs to know that what we focus on expands and that if we can actually focus on the fact that Jesus offered his peace, that we can actually experience it. We've got work to do. And so we pray for your healing. We pray for circumstances to change. We pray that fear subsides and that your breakthrough comes today. Because I am looking at a room of revival starters. I'll call it fire starters. A revival is basically a spark that started a fire. I'm looking at a room, and you know, yeah, I'm not going to be silent. But I can't do it alone, church. That coworker, they just are dying to know. What's her story? That neighbor, they're just wondering, does anybody care? That waitress that waits on you every Thursday morning at breakfast or Saturday morning or Sunday morning, that's living on the hamster wheel, wants to know, is there really more? We gotta tell them. We gotta tell them that healing is.
is possible. And peace has been offered. And that a life with the spirit that helps us navigate these really difficult circumstances is available. And that not every fear is there to wreck you. Sometimes it's there to prepare you. I'm going to sing a song over you, but I've asked for some help. Because my voice isn't totally back. But I heard this song during my cancer journey. It was on TikTok, of all things, okay? <laughs> it was a TikTok trend. And all you hear on the TikTok trend is the chorus. And it was like, it was just for me. I pray for your healing, that circumstances would change, that, flee, that the fear inside your heart would flee. In Jesus' name, I pray for a breakthrough. And that it would happen today. In that song, I kept going back to that video on really hard days. And now I'm healed. And I'm still recovering. But I'm journeying alongside some of my friends that need direction. And that need healing. And that need a breakthrough. And that are afraid. And we're going to sing this song over you. And I just pray that maybe during this song, you won't be afraid to hold fear in your hands and answer the question. Or maybe you won't be afraid to come up here and kneel and lay the fear down. Amen. Or maybe you would come and light a candle. Eric's going to light these candles here in just a second. Maybe you wouldn't come and light a candle symbolic to the light of the world, knowing that the only way in your circumstances that, said circumstances that you can navigate is to have the light of the world lighting your path. You can come and light a candle. You'll see little stickers in front of the candles. Those are labels. You can write what God has done in your life, healed, delivered, saved, child of God, set free, whatever you want to write there, redeemed, restored, write it down, what he's done there, and you can wear it this week, you can wear it today, in my Bible I have a bunch of stickers in there from over the years of messages like this that I've kept, maybe you can just put it inside your Bible, declaring the truth in every layer of what he's done and declaring that this truth will take root in you. Or maybe you want to write on that sticker, focus. Focus. Because what we declare take roots, takes root. And what we focus on expands. Maybe you have a prayer request you'd like to offer, write it down on your prayer request cards and put it in the baskets. But I know this, these steps, we call them altars. And I kneel. I kneel here, I kneel in my bed. And I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not afraid to wonder what somebody else is thinking about what I'm kneeling about. I don't care, I've got work to do. And so tonight, just come, kneel, lay it down. Because my friends, 